Hi, morning, morning. I think, shall we start now? Since we are recording, then I think they may listen this video later on. So, can we start our professional practice? I believe all of you have read the passive questions, right? So, I will go into the questions. But of course, if you guys have anything don't understand, then we, you guys can uh, write in the chat box, then I'll reply one by one. Hey, so first question, um, everybody can see the screen, right? So the first question is, Ali just had graduated with the degree of Bachelor of Law with honor from the Mal University of Malaya. Mutu, have we spent the last 20 years in the UK? has just returned after having been awarded a law degree by University of Nigeria. Mutu had never taken any examination involving the Bahasa Malaysia papers. Aho, Tu has completed his degree and was called to the Honorable Society of Lincoln, Lincoln Inn in UK as a barrister at law. Ali, Mutu and Aho are each of the view that he is a qualified person and authorized person under LPA and at the liberty to be admitted at, to practice as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya. Advise Ali, Mutu and Ahok separately as to the status as a qualified person and authorized person. Okay, so first, first thing I would like to highlight is that there is a difference between qualified person and authorized person. Qualified person means uh, you acquire the necessary uh, qualification in order to become a lawyer but it's not a lawyer yet lah. let's say i have a law degree let's say i study in um so i'm a qualified person but in order to become authorized person uh, i must have go through other requirements for example privilege which means you have to uh go through the nine months uh learning with your master that one is privilege so which means Qualified person is just the first step before you can become a lawyer. But authorized person is after you satisfy all the other requirements, then you become a lawyer who can practice law in Malaysia. Understand? So, back to the questions. Who is the qualified person and who is the authorized person in this case? So, um, just sharing with you all, I don't know you all know or not. Qualified person uh, in general uh, is these three person, which is uh, who study in UM and US, PPTC, which is uh, from UK bar, and CLP student. So CLP, all of you, who, after you pass your CLP, you will be a qualified person, a person who can become a lawyer. Then you need to satisfy another requirement called practical requirement, which is what I mentioned just now, privilege. You have to go through a nine months privilege. And then also, Pursuant to section 11, you must prove that you are not convicted, you are not a bankrupt person, or you have any, haven't done anything this far in England or other country. Then, uh, last requirement, more than 18 Malaysia citizen, and also the uh, you pass the Malay exam. Lah. After you satisfy all of this, lah, then only you can become the authorized person. So, let us back to the questions. Lah. Ali got the degree from UM. So obviously he is the qualified person uh, under section 10. But he is not an authorized person yet because he haven't go through the practical requirement, which is privilege, uh, understand. Then second situation, Mutu study in UK and get a law degree in Nigeria. So unfortunately, this is not a qualified person under section 10 because we only recognize UN and US CLP PPTC. Okay. Then last one, Aho got the um, call to the bar as a barrister at law. So this one is uh, one of the qualified person, uh, which is PPTC student. Uh. So the question also requires us to discuss what is the step to be taken in order to admit, right? So in order to get these 20 marks, uh, then we need to answer one by one. Uh. So I will say... Um, Ali and Ahok qualify as an individual under Section 3 and Section 10 of the LPA. If Mutu wants to achieve the same status, it is recommended that he pursue the CLP and subsequently uh, begins with his privilege with uh, 
we are like, admit other students. Uh. We Ali and Ahok. This way, three of them can be admitted as the advocates yeah. of the system. But of course, my answer is just a short one. Uh. In order to get 20 marks, then maybe you guys need to further down to tell the other requirement now, uh, uh, such as the practical requirement, the character requirement, and also the other requirement. So this is the four things you must have before you become a lawyer. Uh. Okay? Any questions? So I think we practice the same thing. Huh? If I don't see any question in chat box, I will assume no questions. Huh? I think this question is quite easy, huh? honestly. Because he, um, uh, I think he asks every year, huh? the most the same. Huh? They will ask you how to become a lawyer. Huh? Okay. Then next one. Let me see this question. Okay. This question basically is a lawyer who failed to release the balance purchase price to their client. So the question required us to discuss is that, what the compensation fund is all about and ask seek your advice whether she could uh, recover in full her losses from compensation fund. So just briefly explain, uh, compensation month, uh, fund means uh, a fund, all lawyers every year when they renew their license, so-called license, uh, practicing license, they must pay certain money to this fund. And the purpose of this fund is to make sure when a lawyer uh, dishonors or people client money, so the bar counsel, the fund, can use this compensation fund to compensate to the victim. But of course, this compensation fund is not meant to compensate full amount. Lah. First, they will um it's not come, they are not practiced as a first come, first serve. It's not means like when you come, the bar counsel confirm will pay you. No. And secondly, is they will not compensate you in full because they will still have to look into the situation. So this is the two things that you must take note. So to answer this question, they ask you whether she can refund in full or not. Obviously, the answer is no. Lah. And since it's just a five marks, lah, as I already highlighted, five marks, you don't need to answer so many things. Lah. Basically, you just say yes or no and then give your explanation why. So let me just briefly show you. So I think this introduction you can find in Bar Council website as well, like Malaysia Bar, sorry. So um, you can just briefly tell the history like, like established in 1978 to protect the interests of the member and then uh, those clients who are suffered losses arising from the dishonesty of the lawyer. Then the Bar Council may use the money here to mitigate the loss, uh, take notes, uh, is to mitigate the loss, uh, is not to compensate the full amount. Uh. Like I said, they are not meant to compensate in full for all your losses uh, because they still have to depend on uh, the situation. Uh. So this is basically what compensation fund means. Uh, okay? And I believe they will also ask you about professional indemnity insurance. These two things always come, to, uh, come together is because uh, one, Compensation fund is to cover uh, fraud and dishonesty, okay? But on the other hand, professional indemnity, la, usually we call PII, la, is to cover negligence only. So, for example, let's say today um, I receive my client um, purchase price, but I misuse the money for my own. So that one will be covered by compensation fund because that one is fraud and dishonesty. But on the other hand, if the today the situation is when I advise my client and negligently uh, conduct my case, in that case, uh, my client can sue me for my insurance. That one is PII. So you have to understand compensation fund is for uh, dishonesty and fraud. Professional indemnity is for negligence. Okay? So this is the two different now. But they are the nature is the same because it's to make compensation to the client, to the victim. But just that um the 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 one is covered negligent, one is covered for fraud fraud. So what the professional indemnity insurance of an advocate and solicitor entail and whether she could claim the insurance company directly for her losses, the answer will be yes. Lah. So as I said, it's five marks. So you need to briefly explain what is PII. And then uh, also, uh, you... let me mute some student. Uh, okay. okay, so my suggested answer will be, this one I think is about the same, lah, but this one later I will share in my Facebook. 
uh, for 2A is what about a compensation fund? And then 2B will be the PII. Lah. So again, whenever all lawyers want to renew their practicing license, uh, they have to pay this PII also. But it's not paid to Malaysia Bar. This PII, they will pay to the insurance company. So this is the two things we need to pay every year. Lah. So let's say lah, in the future, all of you here, you practice as a lawyer, then you will know lah, this is the money we have to pay every year. Okay? No question, right, so far? Then shall we proceed? Okay, whether old conduct amounts to misconduct, of course, I think obviously, lah, take client money is obviously is a misconduct, right? Then, um, I think the challenging part will be during exam whether you can remember the sections or rules or not. So, of course, I have an advantage of open the book. Lah. So, what I can bound is section 94, sub 3, C and D. So, C basically is dishonest and fraudulent conduct. And D will be breach of any rules of practice and etiquette. Lah. So, obviously, when you kept client money, never release to client, uh, this is a breach of etiquette rules. Lah. Or if anybody has any new idea or any rules can mention, can, can let me know. Lah. But again, like I say, it's just a fine marks. Lah. So, you do need to give a lot of sections. Lah. Just briefly, that will do. Lah. Save your time for those uh, big questions, for example, trending marks questions. Lah. Last one. Whether she can lodge a complaint against O with the disciplinary board and what order the board may make? Of course, we can. Lah. Okay. So, pursuant to section 94, LPA, all advocate and solicitor are subject to the control of the board for disciplinary matter. Consequently, S may file a complaint against O, given O violation of section 93, sub 3, sub C, and sub D. An advocate and solicitor found guilty of misconduct may face the following disciplinary action. Number one, remove from the road. Suspension from practice, not more than five years. A fine not exceeding 50,000, reprimand and censure. So this is the all uh, 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 order can be made by a disciplinary board. You can find this in section 93. So this one actually, uh, if you're familiar with your LPA, you can find the answer in the LPA. Lah. Okay. No question so far, right? We proceed. Okay. So the next question, let me see. Uh, okay. This question basically is uh, Pudu, who are advocate and solicitor, practicing as a sole proprietor, is being sued by a licensed money lender. S. He then filed appearance through his firm. An objection is being raised by the solicitor for the plaintiff on that appearance. B then decided to request his wife, C, who is also an advocate and solicitor, practicing as a sole proprietor of Panga & Co. to take over conduct of the brief. Panga & Co. share the share office telephone numbers with Udu Chambers. C has previously acted for S in many other briefs for loan recovery. Okay, so the question asks us whether they have violated any etiquette rules or not. So obviously they are um this is the chapter for acceptance of brief lah, which means in what situation you may or may not take the case or accept the brief. So based on what I can see, obviously, you shouldn't ask your wife to act for you because this will affect your professional in, uh, in independence and also embarrass, which is rule three. Yeah, rule three, embarrass. I think you can refer to the case as well. Uh, there is a case uh, to say they are acting for their brother and sister. Based on this case also, the court say it's, it's not allowed. Uh, okay? And then also it will affect the professional conduct because it's your wife uh, and also professional in uh, independence. Why independence? is because uh, the question do mention that C previously acted for S in many other brief loan recovery. So you may have some certain um, information which are, you are not supposed to disclose. Uh, okay, so this question 10 marks. I think you just put maybe three or four of the rules and then just give some elaboration. You can secure the 10 marks already. So, yeah, my opinion will be they are conduct is between the rule three, embarrassed. Rule 4, professional conduct, and rule 5, professional independence. Okay? I think so far, so good, right? But until question 4 will be slightly hard, harder, I think. Okay? So the next one will be L, advocate and solicitor, has successfully defended 
uh, K in a silver suit by his wife, we, against the property value at 10 million. L then issued an invoice to K for his professional fee of sum of 2.5 million, which K claims to, to be excessive, lacking in particulars. L then responded to say there is an oral agreement between them that he is entitled to a sum equivalent to 30% of the value of the property if he success in defending the suit. K is came to have an invoice tax. Okay, um, just sharing. Uh, do you guys know a lawyer fee will be divided into two, which is contentious and non-contentious? So let's say if your case is non-contentious, the legal fee will be governed by solicitor remuneration order, which means, uh, let's say like, I'm doing a sale and purchase agreement. I cannot simply decide how much I want to charge my client. I must follow the solicitor remuneration order. And um, just for your information, we have a latest amendment, or not amendment, uh, new rule uh, for this solicitor remuneration order. Last time is 2005, but right now is 2023. It's a new one because the park council know everything, uh, the price increasing, inflation. So that's why they, they amended. So uh, I'm not sure whether you guys know or not the, the revise of the skill fee, but just take note uh, for non-contentious, they are following solicitor remuneration order. But on the other hand, if you are contentious matters such as litigation, um, go to court, fighting, those cases, are, uh, there is no skill fee for this. So you can charge as high as you like. Of course, it's reasonable. Lah. And also, there, there are certain considerations you must take into account before you give the quotation. Lah. So such as what? Um, if I may, can I refer everybody to Rule 11? Rule 11 of the Professional Practice and Etiquette Rule. Rule 11. Never mind. Let me share the screen with you for uh, Rule 11. So what's so good? Uh? Nobody got questions? Uh? Like a, like a stand, like a, like a, like a, like Blue 11. Oh, Blue 11. Fee for litigation or contentious matter. So this is from A until H. Uh, this is all the consideration uh, Malaysia bar or may may uh, look into it when, when you are claiming your fee. So for example, your time, your labor skill required. Uh, let's say if I just apply a grant of probate, let's say I cannot charge like 20,000, 50,000, right? Unless like it, uh, there's a lot of property involved. Lah. Otherwise, they have to consider how long you, you need to complete a case. Mark. Cannot be like uh, a case handled for one year and a case handled for three months, but the price will be the same, right? So this will be the factor to be considered. Lah. So what I'm trying to say is that when the question they are asking you that or oh, whether the, the legal fee is reasonable or not, the first thing you need to determine is whether this is contentious or non-contentious. Non-contentious means like SMP, a loan agreement, uh the charge document, those are so contentious, like go to court. Lah. Usually, I, I think mostly they refer to the matter in court. Lah. Okay, so back to here whether the oral agreement is enforceable or not, which means they orally to say I can pay you 30% equivalent to the, 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 the fee, whether it's okay or not. Um, I don't know all of you know or not. In Malaysia, actually, we are not allowed to take this thing we call contingency fee. Contingency fee means, um, let's say I fight for my client. I tell my client, if I win, then I need to take a certain cut from your um, amount. So this is called contingency fee. La. Or you can understand that no win, no fee. So in Malaysia, actually, it's prohibited because we follow UK law. So if I may share... 
Okay. Actually, we don't have a law directly to say we cannot. But then, because we follow UK, UK doesn't allow this, uh, this practice. Uh, so we follow UK, we say it's not allowed. And also, Section 24 contrast act say it's against public policy. But against, uh, you have to take note, uh, Section 24 never say lawyer cannot take contingency fee. No. Section 24 just say whatever contract against public policy is void. So what is against public policy? We follow UK law. UK law say illegal. Therefore, it's against public policy. So please take note that uh, if you want to explain this, uh, this section never say it's illegal. This section just say against public policy is void. Okay? So this will be the reason uh, for you to prolong your answer uh, if you want to write longer. Uh. But again, like I say, it just, I don't know, it's too much of five marks. So you don't need to give so much of elaboration. Just make it simple to say, we follow UK law. UK say it's prohibited, therefore it's not enforceable. Okay? Then, okay, ah, this one I think is the hardest part I mentioned just now. Grow some bill. And also, I think some of you may saw like um bills of, of cost. Honestly, ah, before doing this question, I don't know what is this. I, I don't even know. After I attending this past question in order to prepare for this class, then I go and study. Then only I can understand some lah. But do let me know if I explain wrongly. Ah. So the question is asking, what is gross sum bill and whether the same amounts to a bill of cost for the purpose of taxation? So um, this one, gross sum bill can be named as summary bill. So from what I understand is that uh, um, pursuant to section, if I'm not mistaken, 112. Uh, let me see. Uh, no, it's not 112, sorry. Ah, one two one. Let me download the sections for you all. Ah, one two one. One two one of the LPA, by the way. Okay, one to one. So if you look at one to one, uh, they will mention two things, uh, three things: bill of cost, deduce bill, or gross sum. So based on my little research, uh, basically gross sum bill compared to deduce bill, uh, gross sum means like they, they just put a amount to tell you this is my legal fee. On the other hand, details bill means uh, they will put down, itemize down all the particular why I bill, uh, charging you for this about, what is this about for, and I give you the details. So, you understand these two concepts? Uh? So, I think can, can those people try to mute your speaker? Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. So, back to the question. They are asking you, what is gross sum bill? So please take note that uh, you have to answer two parts. Uh. Number one, what is gross sum bill? Number two, whether gross sum bill is the same amount to a bill of cost or not. So for the first part, my answer will be gross sum bill is a summary bill. It doesn't give the breakdown of how the sum uh, claim was arrived at. So you never tell how you calculate this fee. Your lawyer just tell you 10,000, but never tell you why the 10,000, what is the 10,000 for, okay? So... Next question, whether the gross sum bill is amounts to the bill of cost or not. So there are two completing cases. The first case is Yan Zhong Hua, Yao Zhou Hua. A gross sum bill is not a bill in the taxable form within the meaning of 132 of the LPA. Okay, so which means in this case, they are saying it's not the same. But on the other hand, in John An, this case, the court held that the phrase bill of cost include gross sum bill and details bill, which means they believe there is no difference between gross sum bill or details bill. Both are the bill can go for taxation. Okay? Like I said, in section 121, they mentioned two types of bill. Ma. They say the bill of cost can be details bill or gross bill. Details means, as the title suggests, la, they give you the details. Gross sum means they just give you the, 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 the amount. They never tell you what is the 
particular. So in the second case, they say both are the same meaning. Both can go for the tax tax purpose, taxation. Okay. So this is the case. So if you look at the marks, uh, they only give you like two, five marks. So actually by answering them is good enough already. But of course, during exam, I also don't know. I have to do my research only. I can answer these questions. Okay. But it's okay. Just take it as a lesson. Lah. So next one. What is taxation and explain the process? Okay, again, I have to be honest. Lah. Before this, uh, I thought this taxation here means like you pay the tax. But based on my little research also, it shows that they are not, they don't mean to say the, the paying tax, uh, the tax. They are referring here, taxation in the context of the LPA generally refer to the process of assessing and determine legal costs. Taxation is a way to resolve dispute between advocate and solicitor and their client over the amount of legal fee to be paid for service with him. But according to Section 126 of the LPA, the client may make such application within six months on the delivery of the bill. So which means, uh, based on my understanding, based on my little research, uh, the taxation here is not to say pay tax. It's to refer to when your lawyer gives you the bill, then you need to ask your lawyer uh, to explain. You want to assess the process of assessing whether the legal fee is excessive or not, or reasonable or not. This process is a taxation. I don't understand why, like, actually, maybe my English got problem, like, but I thought taxation will be means paying tax. But here, obviously, in LBA, they don't mean it. Like, that means like uh, they, they want to determine, they want to discuss about the legal bill. So, here they mean taxation. Okay. Okay. Don't worry, this um uh, I will share this in my Facebook later. Lah. Okay. So can we proceed? Hey, so far so good. Huh? Nobody got questions. Huh? I don't see any question in the chat box. Okay. Never mind. Then we continue. Okay, this kind of questions are uh, usually very long. Huh? You know uh, all these are not important one. Just read the the, the 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 question straight away because usually the, the upper part uh, when they write very long uh, usually it's not, uh, nothing to do with a question one so what is your opening speech and closing speech in silver case so i don't know how many of you are from bac i go and flick my six or seven years ago my bac books uh, actually in the last chapter uh, they do mention what is opening speech and closing speech so if you want, you can refer to the chapter called Advocacy and the Trial in Court, Examination of Witnesses. Okay, let me show you all. So what is this? Uh? Um, I don't know many of you know or not, when you want to start a trial uh, or in Malay, Pinjara, uh, okay, you need to have an opening speech, which means you need to briefly explain to the court what is the case about why I want to start this suit so that the court has an idea that what you want to start, what you want to say, what you want to uh, receive the evidence from the witness, okay? Of course, on the other hand, closing speech will be once you have done all the examination already, then you have a closing speech to, to uh, give a conclusion, uh, so-called, okay? And also sharing with all of you, I don't know you know or not the process. Uh. So basically, when you go to court, uh, all witnesses will have three stages. Number one, examination in chief, which is uh, signing the witness statement. Number two, the opponent lawyer will ask you questions to ask you challenge the witness uh, credibility or those questions in the witness statement. We call cross-examination. So once the opponent done the cross-examination already, your turn, you will do the re-examination, which means you will give, you, give the chance to the your witness to answer your question. So, let me give you a scenario. Uh, recently, I'm busy with one case. Um, my client bought a land, but then the vendor delayed in the process of uh, delivering the house to my client. So my client start a suit to sue the vendor for late delivery of the house. So, of course, in my client witness statement, my client will say, I need the land urgently because I want to expand my business. So when I say this in my witness statement, is uh, examination in chief. So I sit down. The opponent lawyer will stand up and challenge the my client credibility to say, uh, how you know when you get the land, you can uh, gain the profit. 
I'm putting it to you. You cannot make sure, even though you have the property, you have the land, you can make the same profit. Yes or no? Ah, okay, this is cross examination. So the lawyer done. So when I turn, then I will give my chance to my, my witness, uh, free examination. I will say, okay, uh, Mr. So-and-so, can you explain to the court why you think you can make such a profit if you have the land early? Ah, then he will say. Lah. So basically, this is the sequence in the trial uh, we will have. Lah. Okay. Okay, I saw one question. Robert, hi, Mr. Reynolds. Later, could you ask, please kindly take a photo of the opening speech and close? Think speech notes for us. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. This one actually I have put in my suggested answer here. So okay, here. So basically, like I say, opening speech delivered by the plaintiff or his counsel is usually the first formal statement in civil trial. Uh, its primary purpose is to provide an outline of the case to the judge or jury. But Malaysia, we don't have jury, we only have judge lah. Okay. Closing speech delivered at the end of the trial allow both parties to summary their argument and evidence, highlight their stronger point, and pursue the judge or jury to rule in their favor. Okay, so this will be the answer for this one. Actually, I think this question is not like super hard, but because it's not common. So let's say like if you guys see first time in the exam, you may not know how to answer like. But this kind of thing actually you see in a civil procedure actually. I, if I am not mistaken, it's order 35 lah, to support. Okay. But like I said later, I will share in Facebook. Lah, okay. Next one the order of examination of witness in trial and whether the order may be changed by the judge hearing a case. So this one will go to the what I explained just now. Lah. You will have an examination in chief, you have a cross examination, you have a re examination. So usually, you will start from plaintiff first, usually. But the question asks you whether you can change the sequence or not. Yes. Yes, but usually it won't happen until and unless the burden shift to the defendant. Because everybody knows, right, evidence that the burden is on the plaintiff to start their case. Let's say today I say, somebody stole my wallet. I have to prove it. But in certain situations, the burden may reverse to the defendant. So in that case, then the defendant will start their case first. Understand? I can give a scenario, for example, um, employment case. Um, I just recently I learned as well. I just know if it's an employment cases are uh, unfair dismissal uh, wrongful dismissal uh, the burden actually is from the company. It's not from the claimant. The claimant here means the employee. Which means uh, today, let's say my boss um, fire me. It's not my burden to prove unfair dismissal. It's the boss burden to prove first they did not unfair dismiss me. Understand? So. In that case, then the, the, the examination will start from the company, which is the defendant, not the employee, not the uh, plaintiff. Okay? Okay. I think we can proceed. C. The court control over the question they may be asked and extent to which the court, a judge hearing a case may interfere and ask a question to a witness. Okay. Before I go further, um. Anyone heard this word before? Adversarial system. A D V E R S A R I A L. Adversarial system. So, if any of you heard this word before, uh, adversarial system means uh, we are practicing like uh, both lawyers argue in front of the judge. And it's not the judge to control the situation. Uh. So, which means the principle is that. Law submission and the point should come from the lawyer and it's not from the judge. So the judge has no role to help uh, the lawyer. So which means, what I'm trying to say is that the question is asking uh, whether the court can interfere, what kind of question can ask or not. Generally, cannot because we are adversarial system. So should be from the lawyer to, to exercise their, their knowledge to help their client. The judge is just there to, to, to give a fair decision. Okay, so however, of course, here, uh, what kind of question can be asked or not actually is stated in the evidence act. Lah. So the scope of the cross examination is defined in section 146 of the evidence act, subject to the limitation, which is relevancy, a voice of the indecent and scandalous questions, and also insulting, annoying question. Which means, uh, like I said, you can ask any kind of question you want. You can ask what is your mother's name, what is your mother's handphone number, can, but is subject to relevancy. 
So which means the judge may stop you to say, hey, what is the relevant? Why, why you want to ask this kind of question here? And also you cannot score the winners. You cannot insult the winners. All this kind of question is not allowed. Although we practice adversarial system, the judge usually cannot stop you what kind of question to ask. But like I said, you need to ask relevant question. Okay? So this will be the answer. Lah. Okay? Okay, right? Then shall we continue to our landlord? Um ah okay. Basically, I, I I I think everybody have read the questions, right? So this question basically is uh Malay reserve land. So whether who can the question is who can buy the Malay reserve land? So here we have two purchaser, potential purchaser. Number one will be a Malaysian Chinese, another one will be a Shalikat Maju and fully owned by two individuals, Yusuf and Ali. So which means a Malay company versus a Chinese, Malaysian Chinese. Who can buy a Malay reserve land? I think everybody knows that Malay reserve land, as the title suggests, is only Malay can buy, la, reserve for Malay. Ma. But the thing is, five marks. So you need to, if you just say, oh, only uh, Syariqa Maju can buy because they are Malay, of course you can get like one or two marks, la, I think. But when without the law, uh, so maybe they, go, they, they they are not going to give you full marks. Uh. So, uh, of course, I have an advantage of do my research. Uh. The law will be Malay re Reservation Enactment. So this law says that only a Malay or Malay company who can acquire Malay Reserve Land. Okay? Okay? Sure. Next one. Can Ismail successfully remove one private caveat? I think of course can uh, because on the facts, Wong is only paid 5,000 as an early deposit mark. So which means Wong only acquire a man, man, monetary uh, interest. It's not capable interest. I don't know any of you know about in what situation can we enter KVIP uh, or not. Uh, just uh, quick sharing. Usually only these three situations. Number one, claiming title. Number two, claiming registrable interest. Number three, claiming right to title. So what does it mean? Uh? Let me give you an example. Gambling title, um, for example, I'm entered into an SMP. I'm claiming a title. I want to buy the land, so I'm claiming a title. So, so some of you may wonder, hey, then how come Wong cannot qualify as a claiming title? It's because Wong is only pay 5,000. Just a 5,000 doesn't mean you can claim the title. It, it just shows that you book the land, you pay the booking fee only. So pursuant to the case law, your suffer is just 5,000 so people can just return your money because it's not that great. Lah. Unless today you have paid the full purchase price, then yes, you are claiming the title. You are the owner. Just that you haven't registered. Okay. Number two, registrable interest. So please remember uh, the interest here uh, refer to bank, uh, lease, uh, um, Eastman, uh, whatever interest can be registered, we say registrable interest. But um, most of the situation, they refer to a bank. Uh, okay? And right to the title, like I say, uh, I have the right over the property. Let's say it's my fatherland. I have the right over the property. My father passed away. Already. I want to protect my fatherland. So I want to enter Kivit to protect my fatherland. Understand? So this is the situation where you can enter Kivit. Uh. So in this case, since uh, Wong is, don't, doesn't have a cavitable interest, therefore, Ismail is advised to remove under 326 and 327, okay? It's, I think everybody understand what is 326 and 327, right? If anybody, anyone don't understand, just write in the chat box where I will explain. Otherwise, then I will just proceed, yeah? Okay? Then, last one. If one private keyword is removed, can one wife Lily enter a new private keyword on the land on the same ground? Okay, five marks. Very simple. The answer is no. Because section 329 says no second or further keyword unless with a fresh ground. Okay. Okay, I saw one student say uh doesn't understand 326 and 327. Okay. 326 means the private keyword can be removed by proprietor, registered proprietor or registered interest. Like I say, interest means bank, uh, lesso, uh, okay, those kind of people. Registered proprietor means owner. Uh, so which means an owner want to remove a private keyword can use 326. 
A bank who register a charge in the land can also use 326 to remove the caveat. Okay. Uh, the procedure is very simple. You just need to uh, file a Form 19H, then the registrar will serve the 90C to the caveat, which is Wong. Then Wong need to satisfy the three stage test. So, what is three stage test? Which is here. Wong need to show law, he has a cavitable interest law. Wong need to show law, there's a serial question to be solved. Wong need to show on the balance of opinion, it, it will be better to keep the caveat until the full trial. So, like we discussed just now, Wong doesn't acquire a cavitable interest. So, number the test number one, Wong will feel ready. Therefore, under 326, uh, Ismail as the owner, registered proprietor, can remove. Okay. On the other hand, 327. 327 is not removed by proprietor or interest. They use the word called a grief person. In other words, uh, the person who are not happy. Uh, okay. So this person who are not happy uh, usually refer to a purchaser who pay the money already, but then there is a capital interest. Okay. For example, uh, Renault want to buy a land from Dr. Chi. So Renault pay everything already before Renault want to change name, change to Renault name. Okay. Then Renault noticed that somebody um, ended caveat on, on, on the land. So then Renault, Renault will ask the person, hey, why, why you are here? Then the person show up, or oh, my grandmother have some deal with uh, Dr. Chi, therefore Dr. Chi uh, need to give the land to me, etc. Some grandmother story. So in that case, me, Renault, haven't registered my name yet. So I'm not registered proprietor, right? And I also is not a, uh, a registered interest right because I'm not the bank, I'm not a lessor, I'm not a leaseman. Therefore, I had no capacity to remove. And Dr. Chi also doesn't want to help me to remove under 326. So in that case, uh, me as a person are not happy, a great person, I can use 327. I need to show I'm a great person. Then I can do the same thing like 326. Really. I send a notice, ask uh, the capital to remove and show capital interest and also show serious question to be trial, etc. If he cannot show, then uh, the cable will be removed already. Understand? So in that, in this case, in this question, because Ismail is a proprietor, ma, so we just use 326, uh, understand? Right? Um, Shangari, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, do you understand? Then, okay, thank you. So for second question, um, uh, five marks. I think everybody understand, right? You cannot enter a caveat on the same grounds. So my question here also, lo, I say, lo, uh, yeah, three, two, nine, sub two says shall not entertain an application to enter further caveat on same land on the same ground. Understand? Next one. Um. Okay. This question is about opposing the order for sale. Actually, this kind of question, I, I really, really encourage students go and attend this order for sale because it almost comes year out every year and the pattern of asking that the questions are is almost the same. So I really, really encourage people to attend more of this kind of questions. Okay? Um, because they have a few issues, so we will go through one by one. Uh, first of all, before we start, do you know what you need to show in order to oppose an order for sale? The, the word. Start with C. Any, anybody know? If, if whoever know, then just write in the chat box. Then we, we start first, okay? So, L and her brother L inherited their family house elected on a piece of land, freehold land, from their late father. L and L are now resi registered owner of the family property. L wanted to start a small business and she approached Best Bank for a loan to finance her businesses. A business best friend granted R a loan of five hundred thousand, subject to the interest of six point five percent per annum, calculated on the monthly rest. Best friend also requested R and L to change to charge her family property to the best friend as security for the loan. Both R and L created legal charge in favor of best friend for the loan granted to R. Okay. Uh, let me ask her. Uh, two owner, but only one owner borrow money from the bank. This is called third party charge. Third party charge. So wh whoever don't know what is third party charge, please let me know. Uh. So this is third party charge. Uh. Second, unfortunately, our business did not go as expected and our started to default in payment of the money installment to Best Bank. 
Best Bank proceeded to commence legal action to recover loan sum. Okay. So, Al received statutory notice in Form 16E of the NLC. In the safe notice, Best Bank claimed for the full repayment of the entire loan sum together with the interest of 8% on money rest. Okay. Here we'll have two issues to show. Hey, so far, nobody tell me what is the thing you need to show in order to oppose uh, order for sale. Uh. The thing called cost to the contrary, right? Everybody knows, right? Cost to the contrary, CTTC. So, in order to oppose the order for sale, you need to show cost to the contrary. And what is cost to the contrary? Basically, you divide into three things. Uh. Number one, uh, let me show you. Uh, Number one, indivisibility. Number two, condition precedent. Number three, rules of law or equity. Okay? So, the first thing that can oppose will be Form 16E. You know, there's, there are two kinds of form they can use, right, in order to claim the default money. There will be Form 16E and 16E. But with the case of checker, Checkered say it doesn't matter what kind of form they use as long as they serve the notice to you, then you know your default payment. So therefore, whatever form they use, it doesn't matter anymore. Number two, interest. Initially, they say 6.5, but now become 8%. Obviously, this is the cost to the country. Why? Because you cannot change the interest arbitrarily. So the cases I have is a few. Lah. You can pick any cases you feel easier for you to remember. But you changing the interest is a cost to the country, basically. Okay, so please take note. Number one, cost to the country, you cannot change the interest. And also penalty. So this one also the cost to the country. I will put in the same point, which is you change the interest and also additional 1%. Okay, continue. I'll remember there is no mention of penalty interest in the loan agreement. Further, the statutory notice stated all money due were payable within seven days from the date of the notice. No notice was sent to Lee. So this is the second cross to the contrary. Pursuant to NLC, uh, the gap uh, for them to repay uh, the time must be at least one month. But on the facts, they only give seven days. So they go against the section 254 already. Understand? Which means uh, the process is if you own the bank money, the bank need to issue notice to you and give you one month to repay. So this is the second thing that, uh, against the law, okay? And no notice sent to Lee. This one also is not true. Uh, it's not correct because when you want to let long a person land and the land belongs to two person, of course, you have to serve the notice to two person. And if you read the national land code, uh, the national land code actually is say must serve to charge And charge means the person who, who, who uh, charge the land to the bank. Uh, on the facts, the charge must be from two person, must be from the owner. Uh, although it's only one person borrow money. Uh, so that's why just now I ask, anybody know why is the party charge or not? Uh, okay. So they must search. This is the third thing. Uh, number one, interest. Number two, the time must be at least one month. Number three, no notice to Lee. Okay. Then I continue. A month later, Lee received originating summon filed, by, filed at the High Court by Best Man for order for sale of our and Lee family property. Under section 256, the original summon contained all details stated in form 16E, but did not have the hearing date. Uh, this one obviously cannot, lah. order 83. So if whoever you fix to order 83, it will tell you what is the thing you must mention in your originating summon. So the case I will use will be Pervila Harvey Bank. Lah. So here you must say, begin by OS, must show the particular, must show the money payable. Uh, Oh, sorry. The date is on mentioned in order 83, but I don't know which rules already. Lah. So later you can go and check. Lah. Basically, order 83 do mention you need to tell the hearing date. Lah. So this is the number four. They never say the hearing date. And last one. Meanwhile, Al managed to get some funding from her friend, S, and now intends to redeem the property for best friend. Al and Lee now search and serve with an order for sale of the family property during issue by the High Court. Both out and leave, come and seek your legal opinion. So, advice whether they set aside or not. So, the answer will be yes because they have four cops to the contrary. Number one, interest. Number two, seven days, at least one month. Number three, no notice to leave. Number four, no hearing date, order 83. So, next question whether they can redeem the property or not. Uh, the answer will be yes as well because 
pursuant to two six six. The charger has the right to tender payment at any time before the conclusion of the sales. Since on the facts they haven't made the order for sales, man, so of course you can tender the money, lah. Understand? Okay, everybody understand? So I can show you my answer. Yeah. Okay. Write down whatever nooks you want. Let me on the account. Too hot already, Malaysia. <sighs> okay. If no question, then I will just proceed to question seven. This is what, uh, let me see. Uh. Order for silver, sorry, fire 300. What is this? Uh? See my answer. Uh. Ah, okay. These questions is about a successful bidder who bought a land through auction, Lelong. Uh. So after he bought the house from Lelong already, uh, he noticed there is a person who are in occupation, which means occupying the land. Uh. So we need to advise him whether being a successful bidder at the auction, public auction, obtain indivisible title to the land. Uh. So I think a lot of students may go into details for the indivisibility. La. Actually, it's true and also not that correct. La. Because uh, when you acquire the property, you make the full payment, uh make full payment to the the, the, the auction, uh, public auction already. Uh. By right, uh, pursuant to NLC, uh, you should get the clean title. Therefore, that they are not supposed to have any squatter or person in the land because you are supposed to have a clean title. So, of course, I can check the case law, but actually they, they do have a section in NLC. You guys have a look of this case first. I show you, I'm going to check the section for you. We have a section to say, if you successfully acquire the land uh, in public auction, then you must acquire a clean title. Let me check. Uh, Ah, two six seven NLC. So you see, any certificate of sales given to the purchaser, okay, upon registration, ah, the title or interest of the charger shall pass and vest in the purchaser free and discharge from all liability. So actually, this section is good enough to say, uh, I have acquired a clean title already. And of course, the question like worth um, 10 marks. So you need to give more elaboration. Lah. So that's why I, I put a case law to say that lah. they acquire an indivisible title. Lah. Uh, so I think I saw some of the students, their paper, they are, they are, they are switched, they write something, lah. They, they discuss the indivisible title. Lah. Because why... Uh, here involve like a few party ma, so you will go into it ma. My personally thing is not correct la, because like I say they mentioned in auction. So the relevant section will be when you acquire a property for auction, what kind of right you have. It's not go into uh indivisible chapter, my opinion. La. Uh whoever have a disagreement, please let me know. Uh. You write in the chat box, I will as a counselor, we can have a debate. La, okay. Then shall we continue? Okay, this one. Actually, I, I think my answer is correct because uh, this card, this case are uh, bayang, uh, and this case are uh, actually they are correlated, you know. I think I found these two cases in this bayangan one. So this bayangan actually also mentioned the uh, when you acquire property in auction, you should get the clean title. So I think my answer is correct. <coughs> but of course, um it's subject to challenge. Uh, Okay, based on the above statement, discuss what are the circumstances in which the indivisible title of a registered owner can be white, which under NLC. Ah, then this one is uh, the indivisible chapter. Why? Because they clearly ask you, ma, in what situation an indivisible title can be challenged? 
in layman terms. Uh, okay. So of course, as everybody know, fraud, misrep, forged instrument, void instrument by operation of law, etc. All this is the situation where you can challenge the indefensible title. Understand? So far, so good, everybody. Okay, okay. Then I will continue. Uh. If I don't see any question in the in the chat box, I will continue. We will go to the last one. And when when I see this question, I know many people go yeah already. Because they are asking um the new amendment. I don't know whether all of you know about this amendment or not. I do aware I, I study, but I don't understand honestly. But don't worry. Uh we all prepare nicely for you. You're all ready. I actually found this uh, comparison in Malaysia Bar website. So our Malaysia Bar actually doing a good job. So this is a uh, comparison. Uh, Left-hand side is the old law. New uh, right-hand side is the amendment act. Uh. But of course, this amendment act have yet come into force, uh, by the way. They are just an uh, amendment and, and, and receive approval already. But then our minister had yet to give a deed come into operation. Uh, okay. So basically, by seeing the comparison, uh, last time it's like 2.5 million. Uh. Actually, I don't know why it's 2.5 uh, because based on my note, it should be 2 million. Should be 2 million, right? Uh, small estate. Yeah, based on my notes, it's 2 million, but I don't know why 5,000 write 2.5. Uh, but please, whoever know why, please let me know. And with the new amendment, they actually put into 5 million. 5 million is small estate. Okay, so which means whoever estate less than 5 million are uh, still considered a small estate. Uh. So my, my myself also don't even have 5 million. Uh, okay, then next one. Last time, this uh, small estate is controlled by LA, uh, land administrator. Uh. But right now, they will have a new officer. They call EDO, estate distribution officer. Okay, so this is the first different law. Uh, sorry, second different. The first different is the amount. Second different is the new title. And number three, um, they will file a petition. He also filed the petition. Uh, but in any stage uh, where the property is situated. No? So which means if your property is in Selangor, then you find Selangor. In Pera, then you find in Pera. Okay? Then, next one. Um, I think this one is too complicated for me. Uh, but basically, for my general understanding is that where you have no application made to probate or LA within six months, uh, they can actually request a uh, public trustee, which is Amara Raya, to file the petition for you. But I don't know why they want to do that, uh, which means uh, now maybe you will hurt some of your relative, your family to say, hey, oh, my, my who and who passed away 10 years already, but I haven't applied the LA, I haven't applied the probate. So with these new rules, actually, they can help you to apply. Uh. Maybe they want to make it a uh, easier for the citizen uh, because they don't want like 20 years, 30 years or 40 years they never apply LA uh, okay then new provision and then here etc uh. honestly honestly I am not familiar uh, but I, I found this uh. later I will share in the Facebook uh, so you guys can have a look uh. Uh, since I'm not the one who see for the exam uh, so you all should go and study yourself uh, okay 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 so we have every Whoever who familiar already can also share with us uh, the, the procedure. Lah. But this is what I found in Malaysia bar. Lah. Okay. So if, when we back to the question trial marks, I think whoever didn't do bankruptcy, then uh bad for you. Lah. I I mind myself also I didn't do bankruptcy. I just do uh ethic advocacy land and probate. So if this question come out in my year, uh, maybe today I'm not here already. All right. So last one. Elaborate the type of evidence must be adduced to prove the lack of testimony capacity. Testimony, testamentary capacity means uh, the capacity to make a bill, right? Uh, compared to contractual capacity. Contractual capacity means whether you can enter contract or not. But testamentary capacity means the capacity to uh, make a bill. Uh. So for this question, my answer will be here to say uh, there are numbers of ways in which the testator Testator mind may not go with his testamentary act. He may lack or, or deem to lack of testamentary capacity. He may not know or approve the contents of the will. He may be deceased into making it by fraud or constrained to make it by force, trick, or other forms of undue influence. So all this will be the example 
of saying he don't have the testamentary capacity. Like say, are people forcing him? Uh, where, uh, he don't know what he is signing. People cheated him to sign something he don't know what is this. Okay, another person may forge a view of proud death of the deceased. So let's say lah, somebody should say, oh, this is the deceased will, but actually it is not. Whenever any of the above matter are proved, the document to be executed by the deceased has no validity and cannot be admitted as a, uh, admitted to probate. So this is found in the one of the book lah, when I do my research lah. Okay, so this is just for eight months, so I think it should be good enough lah. But of course, you can use whatever example you can think of lah, to challenge a person whether who has capacity to make a view or not lah. okay okay what wow, one hour nice nice hour for finish for one pass questions um any question you guys want to ask yes or no if no then i may call it a day of course when we discuss it seem, may seem very easy lah, but um I, I I done my part, but I have to check all the law myself. So that's why I I I it seems easy lah. But during exam, of course, it's different kind of stress lah. You have to think how to find the answer, or or, or some chapter is not that common. Not usually asked in the past year questions lah. Thank you, Robert. So I think we just wait for like five minutes. If no question, then we will just call it a day. Hi, Dr. Chi. Enjoy your Patu Pahat trip. Yes, yes, bro. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for helping. No problem. You you, you help a lot. You see, sending wife and daughter to Patu Pahat also join us. <laughs> the, the, the credit should go to Dr. Chi. No, 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 no. Should be go to you. <laughs> okay, so I think no question. Then we will stop here today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you so much. No problem. No problem. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Keep in touch, bro. Thank you. Uh. No problem. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.